Good afternoon. Welcome to the weekly edition of The Wrap. I'm Laura Leslie, WRAL Capital Bureau Chief. And I am Will Dorn, WRAL State Government Reporter. And, it, well, it was election week for 2.6% of us, <laughs> apparently. That's all Which, the people you know, that turned uh, out. Th- th- that was probably about what I was expecting, turnout-wise. Uh, I was hoping it would get at least a five, right? But, I mean, granted, I mean, it was a you know, pretty limited uh, slate for most folks, and it was terrible weather, which probably had a lot to do with it, too. Yeah, you know, we only had runoffs for one Republican voters, so you know Democrats couldn't even vote in the runoff. Well, in the Orange and, County one, they could, but oh, true, true. Yeah. Um, but, but statewide, yeah. Um, and then the only you know two races, uh, you know, Council of State is important, but you know, uh, you know, it wasn't like a runoff for the, the governor's race. It was for lieutenant governor and auditor, which you know don't necessarily get the same kind of eyeballs as some of the other races that are on the ballot. They could though, because I'll tell you. So um, ba- uh, Dave Bullock, uh, who's on the UNC Chapel Hill. Board of Trustees, sorry, I have to figure that out, um, uh, was the winner in the auditor's runoff. Um, he is going to be running against Jessica Holmes, and that's uh, the Democrat appointee uh, by Governor Cooper. Um, he had a very different sort of take on being an auditor than our recent past few auditors have. Instead of making it more of a ministerial position, he's seeing it more as a political position. So, you know, so it could be a very interesting four years if he wins in November uh, because, I, you know, it's, it's been a while since we've had a – I think it's since less merit probably back in the mid-aughts. Um, you know, we had an auditor that, that was out to sort of make a political point. Yeah. Um, you know, Beth Wood has been the auditor for a long time and, you know, she I think is, you know, really pretty respected on both sides of the aisle for being apolitical, um, which also meant, you know, she was a Democrat, but – she was not afraid to go after other Democrats. I mean, I, oh, no. I've saw plenty of audits that she put out, you know, calling the Cooper administration into question. But, you know, she'd also, you know, go after Republicans as well. So, you know, she tried to kind of thread that needle. And, you know, uh, of course, you know, her career. Ended and she was and, but she was well respected for the vast majority of her career until that unfortunate moment, uh, the Christmas party. But but she, you know, for years she held that office and was widely respected. So and that was kind of the same take that um, Jack Clark wanted to take. Um, who was Bullock's um, the opponent uh, in the opponent. runoff? Right, exactly. But he's very, very young. This is his first time running for statewide office. Well, I think it might be Bullock's first time to run for statewide office as well. Um, but Clark is just you know thirty two. I mean, he actually made a better showing than a lot of people expected him to. Yeah, yeah. There were there were several. I think probably bigger names in that primary. Um, but he was the one that made the runoff, and it was it was a close runoff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it kind of came down to it. Um, you know, the, the one for lieutenant governor was not as close. Uh, Hal Weatherman ran away with that um, over Jim O'Neill, which kind of surprised me um, because, you know, in 2020, I mean, Jim O'Neill came in with within a few thousand votes, I a think. couple thousand votes yeah. of becoming the state's attorney general. I mean, he very nearly unseated an incumbent in Josh Stein, who's now running for governor. And so I thought that would have won him a little bit more. Uh, goodwill with uh, conservative voters around the state, um, but they went with uh, Hal Weatherman instead, uh, who who is also very well known in yes. in especially social conservative circles. Uh, you know, he was worked for years with Dan Forrest, ran his campaigns, uh, worked as his chief of staff when Dan Forrest was lieutenant governor. Um, so he's got a lot of connections as well. So uh, you know, uh, he'll be running against uh, Rachel Hunt uh, for lieutenant governor. Um, for a, a job that doesn't really have any responsibilities for the most part here in North Carolina, it's but four has years of a bully pulpit. Yeah, has a lot of power to yeah the bully pulpit exactly and to prepare for a, a future run for governor. Although we should mention that very few people who have been lieutenant governor actually became governor at least in the last twenty years or so. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that that's another thing. Um, lots of interesting bills this week, and you wrote about a bunch of them. One of them was the to the bill that would criminalize. Criminalize the use of AI to create pornography. You covered this debate. Can you talk about what, where did this come from? Yeah, well, this is, uh, I think the title of the bill is Modernizing Sex Crimes Laws, and that's exactly what it does. Um, Amy Gailey, the Republican senator from Alamance County, is the leading force behind it. And it's really just taking a new look at, you know, we need something to address the growth of AI, but also even things just like texting. You know, part of it is for uh, what they call sexual extortion, which is, uh, you know, I mean, you hear about it, unfortunately, oh, all the time. With kids all with, the time. Yeah, with young people who are sending private images to one another and then someone threatens to expose it unless the person keeps sending more images or, or does something or, else yeah. or whatever. And so this would make that a crime. 
Um, but yes, for, for AI generated um, images of people in that kind of situation where you try to use it to extort someone or any AI generated images of child pornography, uh, creating, you know, new crimes and criminal penalties for those actions. Um, also criminalizing uh, either owning or creating or you know, seeking out sex dolls that are made to look like children, which is just really gross. I had no idea there were such There's things. a market for this. Oh. This bill would make that illegal. That seems appropriate. Uh, there okay. has not been any opposition. <laughs> no, at least not 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 out loud. Um, okay, so let's um, talk for a second about the bill that everybody's been talking about this week, which is the mask bill. And this is a bill that kind of grew out of an, – well, there was a, 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 another bill that passed the House – that would have outlawed masks on people while protesting, right? But then mm-hmm. when they t- got into the Senate, they decided what they would do is just get rid of the exception that they wrote into the law back in 2020 that allowed masks to be worn legally for the sake of public health and safety. Because masks have been illegal since the 1950s, right? Yes. Yeah, we passed the law in the 50s to crack down on the KKK specifically. Um, and there's been a whole lot of, I mean, hours and hours of debate over this bill this week. We obviously won't be able to summarize all of it here, but I mean, it is a potentially a really big change to state law for uh, a lot of reasons. You know, Republicans have kind of downplayed a little bit saying, look, we're only trying to crack down on protests who are sort of abusing these COVID era mask wearing norms to hide their identities during protests. And Democrats are saying, okay, well, why can't you just do that? Why can't you just say you can't, you know, wear a mask at a demonstration? Why do you need to completely revoke, you know, the ability to wear a mask in public for any public health reason? And right. the, the Republican response has been, well, that makes it just easier for police to actually go in and arrest these protesters and actually crack down on them. But um, there's a lot of concern about unintended consequences. I think you've spoken with some disability rights act. act, act advocates about yes. this, right? Yeah, yeah. We talked to uh, Tara Muller over at Disability Rights NC yesterday and really, uh, you know, had a, a, an interesting conversation about this. I mean, you know, there's a lot of folks. OK, first off, I should back up for a second and say that the Republicans say that this bill would not outlaw masks for health reasons because they say the way the law is worded, it says you cannot wear a mask so as to, in quotation marks, conceal your identity. So what it comes down to is what does so as to mean? Does that mean with the intention of or with the result of? Because right. if you're wearing a KN95 for health reasons, you also are concealing your face. Right. And right? It, it just comes down to whatever interpretation, interpretation, interpretation. A, a police officer or a judge has. Sure. So anyway, so that, you know, we just wanted to get that out there. Um, we had that in our story yesterday, too. But the, the disability rights folks are basically saying that, you know, a lot of members of their community have immunocompromised um they are immunocompromised. They may have had organ transplants or something like that. They have to wear masks. And if they can't wear masks in public, then that's going to violate the ADA, which requires people with disabilities to be able to go about their daily lives the same way that everybody else does. Um, and there is a precedent for this in Texas. There was a court case in Texas uh, where a federal court found that um, a, a rule that said that kids couldn't wear masks in school was actually um, violating the dis- the the, uh, the rights of kids with disabilities because they couldn't protect themselves by using a mask. So I, I don't know where that's going to go, but I do know that you know it sounds like it's like ripe for a lawsuit. Um, the sponsor of the bill has said that they are open to making some changes in the House. I think probably what we'll see is they're probably going to have to dial that in some. To and I know DHHS actually suggested some language to try to to try to iron this out. So we might see some of that next week. Yeah. Well, and I mean, we should note. Uh, Democrats offered multiple amendments to this on the Senate floor to and, try to... And some of those amendments were the DHHS language. Right. And those all got shot down by Republicans. And so I, I don't know how much appetite there is. I mean, maybe everyone is just kind of saber rattling at this point. And once the emotions die down, that they will actually be able to work together to, to find some fixes for this. But a lot of people are really worried. And at best, there's a lot of confusion over what this is going to do. And you're right, there actually there there will definitely be lawsuits over this if mm-hmm. it passes into law, as is, and not even necessarily over the mask part, because there's another part for protesters who block traffic. Right. And it would increase criminal penalties on them, um, which, you know, people have some concerns over. But uh, what people say is unconstitutional is a separate part that would allow for civil liability and lawsuits against someone who organizes a protest where someone else blocks traffic. 
you know, so say I organize a protest of, you know, reporters for good reporting and uh, you uh, are marching with me and you step into the street and, and I lay down and an ambulance you, can't get through. You lay down and an ambulance can't get through. Yeah. And even if I'm not even at the protest, I have no idea what you're doing, someone could still sue me. And so critics say that this bill is... Unlikely you know, to stand up in court. Right. Yeah. And there, there's a similar provisions in, in anti-rioting law that passed last year, if people remember that, that allowed for civil lawsuits against people who organize or promote a protest that ends up in a riot that is also being sued over for the same kind of reasons, chilling free speech, anti-First Amendment. That lawsuit is ongoing, um, but you know, clearly a, a theme here in the legislature. And we should note, uh, you know, people brought up the fact that this you know, appeared to be unconstitutional. And uh, the response from uh, Senator Buck Newton, who's the, the Republican sponsor of this, was, go ahead and sue us. We'll see you in court. But this is what we're going to do. That's an expensive tactic when you use it a lot, though, isn't it? Well, we've seen it a lot in yeah. the legislature for years, and uh, you know they, they they keep going. Yeah, uh, another change that some people are describing as a rollback of raise the age. Although Danny Brett, who's the sponsor of the Senator Danny Brett, says that's not the case. Um, so one of the things that raised the age, which is a really groundbreaking law that North Carolina it sort of it took effect in 2019, had the effect of having fewer kids being tried as adults and having all basically people under the age of 18 going at least initially through the juvenile justice system. The idea was that there they could be connected with services. Um, and, you know, and if, if a judge, if they committed a really serious crime or a judge decided that they should, they could simply move them into superior court anyway. Right. right. Well, now the, the change in law would basically say that 16 and 17 year olds who are uh, could, charged with, you know, upper, upper, higher felonies, we'll say, would just go ahead and go back to adult court. They wouldn't go through juvenile court anymore. So, you know, Britt is sort of painting this as this is not a rollback of raise the age because these kids are going to end up there anyway. But of course, people who are proponents of raise the age say, yes, it is, because they're automatically going to adult court, which is the same thing that was happening before we passed that. Right. And, you know, there, we should note that uh, actually Democratic Senator Mujtaba Muhammad, who was one of the main critics of this proposal, uh, he's a former public defender, has worked with juvenile defendants before. He was able to work with Senator Danny Britt on this to make a few changes. Obviously, you know, didn't get all the changes he wanted, but there was a little bit of bipartisanship, uh, you know, on, on tweaking this a little bit. But in general, yes, it is still very much what the prosecutors want uh, to kind of, you know, Yes, roll back some of these changes. It's not a complete rollback of raise the age, but it is a partial rollback of a it partial. for sure. <clears throat> and, you know, we should note this is only, I think they said around 500 cases a year statewide in all 100 counties combined. So, you know, it's not like there's this, you know, epidemic of children running around and committing really terrible violent crimes. But there is actually. But it is happening. Yeah. And so this is an effort to address, um, you know, really kind of the most you know, violent actions of of teenagers. And it just, you know, it's a debate over whether do you think it is more appropriate to treat them in juvenile court and get them access to mental health counseling and job skills and try to set them on a right path? Or do you think it's more appropriate to just send them to adult prison and punish them? I do wonder, though, because we have reported here at WRL that the, the number of, of children committing murder has gone up quite a bit. I mean, we've been tracking those stats. And I wonder how much that might have to do with the fact that you know, Britt was saying part of the reason behind this is because the juvenile courts were getting overloaded. Yeah, well, and there's also this trend that uh, another thing this bill tries to address is, especially in gangs, you know, there has been a growing sense that, well, hey, you know, if if a 14-year-old kid is less likely to be tried for, you know, something like a drive-by or whatever, we'll just have our 14-year-old kid in the gang do the drive-bys. And so this bill would also create a new crime that could be used mostly against gang members would be for when adults entice a child to commit a crime. In the meantime, we're looking forward to next week. Uh, we're, we're waiting on a budget at this point, right? I mean, it's about time of year. We should be starting to see something emerge, and we really haven't heard much about that yet. <clears throat> well, everyone got thrown for a loop with the surplus changing. You know, we thought yeah. it was going to be a $1.4 billion surplus. Now it's down to a billion dollars, which, hey, having an extra billion dollars is not a problem. I'd take it. But, you know, <laughs> but they had already made an extra 400 for million is uh, a lot to deal with, especially when they've already committed more than 400 million dollars to expanding vouchers. 
Right. So uh, so one of the things that um, we talked to Speaker Moore about this week was that exact problem, that the downward shift in the revenue projection and what that's going to mean for the voucher bill. And he said, <clears throat> he said they may have to look for some different funding methods. I mean, there's, they've got rainy day funds out the wazoo, right? We have huge reserves in this state. So it would be likely that they would want to look at that. But it's a question mark to me whether or not Senator Berger would go along with that. Yeah, I mean, it's something that Republicans have bragged about ever since they took over, saying we are being more responsible and fiscally conservative than Democrats were when they ran the legislature. We're putting more money into savings. And that's true. You know, there's all sorts of best practices for, you know, states should put at least X amount, you know, sure. of money each year into savings. And North we have, Carolina has a lot, though. We have been exceeding those best practices for years. So we're well above, you know, what is kind of the, you know, the not even just the minimum, but kind of the normal level to have in savings. So, you know, there is money to dip into, but, you know, the question is, do you want to hold on to that for, you know, when there's a true recession and not just, you know, the voucher program needs more money? Well, we should add that there was some discussion last week about rebates, whether or not there would be rebates. Um, Speaker Moore pretty much said the same thing that Senator Berger did, which is, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's not Probably gonna happen. Yeah, uh, you know, he said, you know, if unless we could make it meaningful, and certainly with less than a billion, it probably would not be. Um, he said he would rather keep that money around to use for capital projects, inflation, because they're hearing after one after another the capital projects that they've already funded are coming in like twenty percent, twenty five percent over budget, and not because of bad budgeting, but because of the in, the inflationary pressures on the construction industry. So he said they're gonna need to put some money into that. Also, of course, you've got the daycare folks who are outside rallying outside the legislature and inside briefly yesterday trying to get their lawmakers attention and say hey we need 300 million dollars to basically bail out the daycares are you going to lose slots for 92,000 kids so there's a lot of things that want that money yeah and i should note the the daycare thing and i think i've said it before on this podcast that is it at least a top priority, if not the top priority for the Chamber of Commerce this year, which is, of course, a very powerful conservative business lobby. They do not want to see employees all around the state having to quit their jobs en masse in July when the federal daycare money runs out, uh, because that would just really throw companies for a loop if, you know, all of a sudden, you know, daycares are shutting down, you know, working parents are having to quit their jobs or cut their hours or Or work from home or or work from home, you know, just scramble. Yep. Well, you know, something's got to shift on that, but nobody seems to be in a hurry to make the first move, either House or Senate on that. It's also the same thing you could say about video slot machines, because we've been talking about that for a while, too. We'd heard that that was possibly a thing. And Speaker Moore joked this week you couldn't swing a cat in the in the legislative building without hitting a lobbyist that had been hired by one or the other interests in gambling. That was a good quote. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, we, we know it's being talked about a lot, but what we know from Senator Berger is that he said he wanted the House to originate it. And then when we asked Speaker Moore about it today, he kind of, or not today, but this week, he just kind of said, well, you know, we haven't really talked about it, but it's kind of muted. We haven't really had a conversation about it since last year. Everyone's being so cagey yeah. with the budget debates. I mean, you know, an extra billion dollars, a lot of people are trying to get their little pet projects snuck in, and there's going to be a lot of horse trading, and a lot of, you know, Priorities being held hostage by one chamber to get their priorities in. So, and we should also mention that a lot of times gambling bills in North Carolina tend to emerge fully formed from a back room. Somewhere. Yes, there's not going to be public debate on this. No. It's going to get written and hammered out in advance. Make sure that they have the votes for whatever. And if we don't see anything, that means that they didn't. They couldn't find the votes for it. And we wanted to mention, last but not least, NC Innovation because it's a controversial program. Not everybody agrees that it should be in existence, but they made their first round of grants this week, right? Yes. uh, I was there for the meeting on Wednesday. And just uh, for people who aren't familiar, this is the $500 million investment that state lawmakers improved last year for this public-private partnership to uh, target basically university research projects that could have some economic potential, but just aren't quite there yet to compete for like private venture capital sort of funding. So the idea is basically like, hey, RTP has been a huge economic driver for the whole Triangle region, but we haven't really been able to copy that in Charlotte, in Greensboro, uh, you know, in eastern North Carolina, near ECU, out in western North Carolina with App State and western Carolina and UNC Asheville. So the the goal is to kind of look especially at those more regional campuses and find these projects that, you know, might not get the attention of, you know, big, deep-pocketed, 
donors, but could have some some real potential for the economy. And so, yes, they they approved uh, several million dollars in grants on Wednesday. Um, whole range of stuff. Uh, there was a project to track mosquitoes, which could lead to you know helping eliminate malaria. There was a project to save the honeybees, uh, which is good for agriculture. You know, uh, we need plants to get pollinated, and honeybees have been dying off as we use more pesticides and chemicals. Um, there was things on a power grid uh, maintenance and really efficiency, which will be good that. for Duke Energy. Yeah. There's something for for lithium mining and refining, which is you know something we're competing with China on. You know, as we build more batteries for electric cars, so that could even have like national security implications. There, it it's, looks like a pretty, pretty promising list of projects. Yeah, and it's just a cool reminder of like, hey, there's all this research happening in our universities on topics that you might never even think about, um, but it takes millions of dollars to get off the ground sometimes. In the meantime, though, um, I think Art Pope, who was one of the board members, was trying to get an audit of it, right? Yes. Uh, he is still seeking an audit of the group. He does not believe that they should have received any state funding in the first place. And uh, I've, you know, I've spoken with him about this. I've read his letter that he sent to the auditor. Um, you know, he, he lays out some pretty specific concerns about, you know, fi- financial and accounting uh, discrepancies that he thinks are going on, and then he also raised more concerns during Wednesday's meeting about their their tax forms. Uh, you know, it's a nonprofit group; they have to fill out a 990, just like any nonprofit does. And he didn't think that their 990 was entirely correct. He thought that they were maybe underreporting some of their lobbying spending, and that they were spending too much on lobbying, anyways, uh, rather than on grants. Uh, of course. You got to spend money on lobbying if you want to get five hundred million dollars from the state legislature. That's right, that doesn't just fall out of the trees. Sorry, does not just happen uh, magically. But uh, in the end, uh, his objections did not win out, and their tax filings were approved. Uh, so who knows? Maybe there will be a little bit more scrutiny into those. But the the rest of the board wasn't concerned by the the concerns that he was raising. I think that's about all for me. You got anything else you want to mention? Uh, also coming up next week, a big vote in higher ed policy. The UNC System Board of Governors is going to take a vote to repeal DEI policies uh, system-wide, all 17 uh, public university campuses. And uh, I've got a story coming out on Sunday uh, all about that, looking into you know kind of the impetus for this, but also just what are we spending all this money on? Uh, you know, it's millions of dollars that go to DEI spending uh we have obviously, you know, thousands of students, hundreds of faculty who are impacted. And, you know, once they take this vote, which, you know, it's not really a surprise how they are going to vote uh, during this meeting on Thursday. What's it going to mean for for students and faculty and, and everybody else with the system? So look for that on Sunday. Great. We'll look forward to reading that. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us here on The Wrap and we'll catch you up next week.